All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Kabbalah and Coffee. So this is our way to get the week started with a bang, right? Way to get the week started with some intense Kabbalah, intense Kabbalistic workout for the mind and soul and spirit and heart, hopefully. So that's the goal of these sessions. This week is a very special week in that we are getting ready for the holiday of Passover, number one. Number two, it's also the week of the Rebbe's birthday. So the Rebbe's birthday is the 11th day of the month of Nisan. For reference, today is the eighth day of Nisan, which means that in just about three days, right, 8 to 11, is going to be the Rebbe's birthday, which is certainly a very special day. Um, one of the birthday fabrengans of the Rebbe that, I, that always stands out in my mind when I think of the 11th day of Nisan and the Rebbe's birthday is when the Rebbe turned 70. So the Rebbe was born in 1902 and the Rebbe turned 70 in 1972. And in 1972, just making myself a tea, I hope you don't mind. 1972, um, the Rebbe mentioned that there were people, you know, well-intentioned individuals that were asking him or suggesting to him that he should maybe scale back his efforts a tad because he's turning 70 and, you know, he has a very intense schedule. If you know anything about the Rebbe's schedule, it was incredibly intense. So there were six, he's, so the Rebbe said at the Fabrengen, at his birthday Fabrengen in 1972, you know, there are people that are, that are suggesting that I should scale it down and whatever. And it was in that Fabrengen that the Rebbe spoke about many incredible topics, including Judaism's, um, anti-retirement stance. That's where the Rebbe spoke about Judaism's anti-retirement stance, essentially saying that the nature of a human being is, then the way God programmed us is with a need, not only a desire, a want, but a need to be productive. And that need to be productive overrides our desire to um relax on the beach forever because it's a need. It's not a want. It's a need to be productive, to feel productive, to feel like we are challenging ourselves. And add. it doesn't mean we have to have the same nine to five job forever, not necessarily, but the idea of retiring of, you know, at some point saying, that's it, no more work, no more. That's not, that's not a, that's not a human thing. In that sicha, in that talk, the Rebbe spoke about why they need it all to work for a living. If God is good, such an epic fabrengen. It's it's all it's all um, it's all recorded. You can find video of it with English subtitles. You can uh, you can watch the whole fabrengen for yourself. I'm going to give you the uh, the the, um, the spoiler the, the 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 clips on it. So the Rebbe asked the question: Why is it in general that we need to work? Like what's what's with that? If God is good, and God could create us in any way, you know, in any, in any possible way, which God certainly could, why didn't God create the human being with all of our needs taken care of? Why do we have to work for a living to make money, to, to eat, to whatever, to get the stuff that we need? Why this whole process? And essentially, the conclusion that the Rebbe came to is because by doing that, God grants us the greatest gift, which is the gift of, of, um, of, What's the word I'm looking for? Mirroring him or resembling him. Because just as God is his own creator, so to speak, God creates. He's not the beneficiary. Let's put it in different terms. God is not the beneficiary of any other force. God gave us the gift of dignity, of not needing, of not necessarily needing anyone else um, not being the beneficiary of, of anybody else, which means essentially the ability to create and be productive. And, you know, obviously we're not fully in control, right? God is still in control, but we do have this co-creationship or co-partnership with God in creating, in, in, in creating our own way, so to speak. This is why God created us with the need to work. Certainly God could have given us everything, but then there would have been an inherent imbalance in the nature of existence where God is the sole provider and we, where God is entirely providing and we are entirely taking. And that is something that would rob us of 
dignity, of meaning, of purpose, of utility, etc. So God gave us the gift of being creators and producers, which is why we work. So at, at that Fabrengen, again in 1972, the Rebbe said, not only, you ready for the punchline, not only am I not retiring, but this year I'm going to step up my efforts and I want to launch, it doesn't sound that bold today, but in 1972, it was majorly bold. In, in honor of my 70th birthday, the Rebbe said, which means that I, when I, now that I'm turning 70, that means I'm in my 71st year, right? Once you turn 70, that means you've lived 70 years, but now you're, you're starting your 71st year. So I call upon Chabad worldwide to create 70 new institutions, seven, sorry, 71 new institutions in honor of my birthday. And, uh, and indeed, so it was. In fact, it was done in pretty much short order. Today, like I said, today Chabad is so, you know, thank God Chabad is so large and whatever. So Chabad is like literally worldwide. Um, even when they, they sent the rover to Mars, I may have said this a few weeks ago, I don't remember, right? They found, they found two things on Mars. They found a, a can of Coca-Cola and they found um, a Chabad house. Now, that's a joke, but I mean, that's kind of not a joke, right? Wherever there's Coke, there's Chabad, and wherever there's Chabad, there's Coke. And sometimes Coke looks at like Chabad and figures out where it needs to open up another uh, distribution center. But here's the point. And that is that today, 70 centers can be done in, uh, I don't know, a month or whatever. But then it was, it was an ambitious goal. The point is that this week is a very special week. It's loaded with energy. It is absolutely loaded with spiritual energy and it's ready for the taking. The example that I've given before is radio waves, television waves, whatever you wanna use. Let's go with radio, old school, right? Radio waves are all around us. The question is, are we tuning into it? Are we able to, not able to, of course we're able to, are we actually doing the work to tune into the energy that is right around us? Spiritually, there's an energy this week, Passover, Yeraf Nisan, the 11th day of Nisan, there's incredible energy that's ready to go, ready for us. All it takes is for us to tune into it. So first theme of today, which is just, again, my 11th day of Nisan, Rebbe's birthday kind of reflection is always challenge yourself. Never become complacent with past achievements. Yes, it's been a great run thus far for all of us. It ain't over yet, my friends. Let's keep on going. Let's keep on challenging ourselves. And if what we created and built up until now has been amazing, let's, let's completely break down all of, uh, all of those limitations, which brings me to Passover. Because Passover is all about breaking out of limitations. Passover is about Exodus. What is Exodus? Getting out of Egypt. Well, in English, that, mean, that makes it very specific to a certain land, a certain nation. But in Hebrew, thank God for Hebrew, right? We have a totally different understanding. Because Egypt in Hebrew is Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim is a composite of a few different root words. If you're familiar, well, I guess in any language, there's etymology, there's root letters, right? Latin roots and, 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 and from English words that have Latin roots, etc. In Hebrew, there are shorashim. There are roots, root letters that form words, larger words, typically three letter, three letter roots, three letter root words that then form longer words. So Mitzrayim, the core of Mitzrayim is Meitzar. The first three letters, Mitzrayim, are Meitzar. Meitzar means constraints or narrow spaces, right? Narrow space. It's like when you're parked at Kroger. Yeah, and I use Kroger specifically. You'll see why in a moment. It's when you're parked at Kroger and they have that angled parking. Work with me here, please. They have that angled parking and very often they have the cart return spaces. Yeah, and you parked a few cars away from one of those spaces. Stay with me, please. And you're trying to return your cart back to the cart return. But the, and you're, the closest path is going to be between a car that's parked and that space. And you start going and then you realize that it's getting narrower and narrower. And the last thing you want to do is scrape a car. So you have to sometimes reverse out and move around. Are you with me on that example? Yes. I use that example because the public's right near us. 
I'm telling you, if they have one car return, we're lucky. And not complaining, by the way. Thank God, you know, thank God for the for the options. But man, oh man, it's it's not it's not easy to return that car, especially if you have a kid. I, I'm just speaking from experience. You get a kid loaded up in the car, and then you realize I got a cart here. What are you gonna do? Send it down the down the hill? It's like have fun, you know, go home. You know, it's like if you love something, set it free. Can't do that with a with a cart. So then you load up the kid with the anyway, it becomes complicated. Getting back to our story. Mitzrayim are those narrow spaces. Those narrow spaces where you where you start off going and then you realize eh, it's a little bit narrow. We're, we're getting a little bit stuck. Mitzray, the whole point of, of, of Passover on an annual perennial basis is all about reminding ourselves and giving ourselves the energy to truly break out of our limitations with the understanding that the exodus that happened 3,300 and 33, yeah, this year's 3333. Look at that. Feels like we're in Vegas. No, that's something else. 777. Anyway, 3333. Easy, easy number to remember. So it's not about what happened 3,333 years ago. Because honestly, that's some stale matzah. I'm just saying. That's that's a matzah that that's uh, that at this point is a little bit stale. Passover is all about the current, the timely exodus that you and I need. That's why we do it. That's why we have a Seder. That's the whole point. The whole point of Passover is to, to allow us to tap into the energy of the holiday, which I spoke about a few moments ago about the energy being tapped into, and to utilize that energy to inspire ourselves to break out of all of those mitz, mitzarim, narrow spaces that we find ourselves in because we are definitely in those narrow spaces. What constitutes one narrow space or one form of limitation? It's satisfaction. That is one form of limitation, being satisfied with our accomplishments. I feel good about myself. I feel good about what I've, what I've accomplished, where I am in life. And that's a wonderful thing. But with every good comes a drawback. And the drawback is, as good as it is, it constitutes a limitation because yeah it's great right yes what we've done up until now is amazing and we're accomplished and thank god we've done a lot of things spiritually and, and pragmatically in the world etc but nonetheless if we become complacent with our past accomplishments and we cease to grow well then that becomes our new box that becomes our new limitation out of which we must break out every passover we are reminded of the constant struggle to break out of our limitations. And part of that is feeling the discomfort of where we're at. Now, the challenge is if we feel comfortable where we're at, right? So then when's the growth? So we have to sometimes feel or impose upon ourselves an element of discomfort with the status quo in order to continue to grow, to never be satisfied with where we're at. It reminds me of a wonderful anecdote that Rabbi Dr. Torsky, a blessed memory, shared. There's, it's a wonderful video that I've seen where he talks about a turtle and how a turtle expands its shell. And I mentioned it at, at a class probably a month or two ago, but I think it bears repeating in the context of today's, uh, today's opening. He says, how does it, what, what happens with a turtle? Maybe it's a certain type of turtle, whatever. So the turtle grows and at some point its shell becomes too small and it feels that discomfort because it's growing and the shell is too small and it feels like it's, it's being suffocated. So it goes behind a rock formation where it's protected and it, it shakes off. It somehow disconnects and sheds its shell. And then in that safe space protected from danger, it grows a new shell that's much larger until such time that it grows larger, feels the discomfort once again, sheds the shell and grows another one that's larger. And that way it continues to grow by continuously growing, shedding, feeling the discomfort, shedding the shell and growing a new one. So Dr. Torsky, who was a psychiatrist and was just an, a rabbi, a uh, Hasidic rabbi, um, uh, a descendant of a, of, a, of a dynasty of Hasidic leaders and rebbes in their own right, um, Again, a psychiatrist, somebody who helped 
countless people with, with, with addiction and recovery. So he said, imagine if the turtle went to a psychiatrist or psychologist, you know, I'm feeling uncomfortable, right? What would have happened? Would have gotten prescribed medication to not feel uncomfortable anymore, right? Oh, you're feeling uncomfortable. You're feeling a little anxious. All right, so take this and you won't feel uncomfortable anymore. But then you know what happens if you don't feel uncomfortable, then you'll never grow. That's the point. It's when you feel the discomfort that you can then push against the limitations, shake them off and grow bigger and better than before. But it's only when we feel the edges, the perimeter of those limitations that we can break through them and break past them. So that's the energy of this week. It's about never being satisfied with where we're at. It's about recognizing our limitations, however lofty they may be, but recognizing them as even spiritual limitations, right? Even if we're, 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 we're checking some boxes, some major spiritual boxes, and that's great. But is there not room to improve? And if there is, then the status quo becomes our new Mitzrayim, which is why. Which is why Hasidic teachings remind us that the Exodus needs to be relived, not just once a year, but every day. V'chal dar v'dar, our sages say, in every generation. And the Alta Rebbe and Tanya adds, V'chal yom v'yom, in every single day, a person must undergo the Exodus for themselves, personally. So that means that Passover is not just once upon a time. Passover is right now and not just once in every generation, once in our lifetime. But it's meant to happen on a daily basis. What yesterday was the breakthrough, today is the limitation, right? Yesterday, my breakthrough, today is my status quo. And that's my limitation that I need to break through to keep on growing. This is not about making us perpetually in a state of, of, uh, of, of, of being depressed or being sad or being, you know, like beating ourselves up. That's not the intention. It's all about positive growth, which happens by feeling the contours and recognizing that this too is a limitation. Let me bust out and let me grow beyond. So it's not about the negative, God forbid. It's about the positive. It's about growth. It's about that Fabrengan in 1972 where the Rebbe says, not only am I not retiring, but I'm throwing down a challenge, 71 new institutions this year, which was met within a, a relatively short amount of time. So that's the energy of the week. And by the way, if you want to know more about Passover and get prepped spiritually and pragmatically for Passover, we have a session coming up tonight called Prepping for Passover. Everything you, everything you need to know to master the Seder. But it's not just about mastering the Seder. It's really about getting ready for the holiday. I'm going to give you practical tics, tips um, I'm going to give you um, so practical tips, spiritual tips, and we're going to go through the Seder and the essential, essential items there if you're doing it at home or doing it with others. But this way, you'll get ready. And by the way, even if you're very familiar with it, it's been a year, right? No matter how familiar you, you are with it, it was literally a year ago. And without studying it again, there is no way, I'm telling you from, from personal experience, right? There is, no matter how many times you've done it and even led it for others, which I've done leading community seders, et cetera, or leading my own family seders, you literally need to go through everything again before the holiday to, to remind yourself of all the details because there are details. And especially we're going to go through spiritual stuff. This is happening tonight, by the way, at 7.30. Um, free open to everybody. Share the information. Uh, it's on our website, intownjewishacademy.org slash Passover. You can get the link there. Well, it's, you can register for it. It's free RSVP, just RSVP for it, and I'll send you the link. Um, I'll also be posting it on social media, the direct link to, uh, to Zoom. So join us tonight and spread the word as well, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All right, back to our story. Rabbi, excuse me. Yes. Rabbi, so you mentioned that we need to renew this, these personal challenges every day. Is there a particular prayer that's part of the daily ritual or one that we could add into it? Yeah. Are you talking about in the context of this theme or the context of adding? I'm saying you you said we need to every not just on Passover but daily. Yes, the theme of you know personal. Yes. So growth. every single day. Excellent question. So Donna's question is where do we see this reflected in our daily liturgy? So the answer is every single day we say the Shema. 
and including including the Shema and the prayers preceding and following the Shema is a recollection of the Exodus. Literally, in our prayers every single day, we talk about the Exodus, and it's a it's a misconception to think that while well, Jews are stuck on the Exodus, right? Like, oh, get over it. It's 3,333 years ago. All right, you're free. The Egyptians are no longer enslaving you. Get over it. It's never been about that. It's never been about that. It's never been about a slave mentality or victim mentality. On the contrary, the Torah says in Deuteronomy to break, th to break free out of that psychology of, of victimhood. I mean, the whole Torah is about breaking free, free of that psychology of victimhood. It's never been about that. It's always been about a reminder that just as there was a Pharaoh who lived 3,330, whatever, 3,300 years ago, right, who did enslave you physically, there are pharaohs today, whether external or internal, that are likewise enslaving you and I. And it could be our own spiritual satisfaction. Like, oh, look, thank God I'm in such a good place. That's a pharaoh. Again, I don't want to be, it's, it's not about negative, but that today could be a pharaoh, right? What yesterday was, was Moses and freedom is today pharaoh. <laughs> so that's why in our prayers we recite the story, we tell the story of the Exodus every single day. And you might be thinking, well, if you do it every day, then what's Passover about? Okay, so once a year, we have like the deluxe version, right? So every day we have the mini reminder, but on Passover, we do the real experiential situation. We eat the matzah, we taste the bitter herbs. I'll be speaking about that tonight, a little bit about the experiential learning in, uh, in, uh, in the session prepping for Passover. But yeah, that's where we do it every day. And in the context of what I thought you might have been asking, which I think you weren't asking, but I think that's also a good question if you were also thinking that. And that is, right, if, so for example, one area of growth could be in prayer. So if, if every day we pray for, let's say, five minutes. Okay, great. Five minutes is, 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 a, great, is a great segment of prayers, but that's now my, that's now my box. So today I'm going to go six minutes. All right, and I'm, okay, after 365 days, you're going to say, well, that's like, how many hours? That's many <laughs> hours. So I'm not suggesting every day is necessarily adding one minute, but again, conceptually, we can add more time or add more depth to what we're doing, praying, you know, the mitzvahs that we're doing, the, the tefillot, the prayers that we're praying, the Torah that we're studying, etc. Always room for growth, and that's really the theme of this week. So it's really important. I think, to tap into the energy that's available and accessible. It's also a theme that we'll be speaking about tonight. There's an energy in the air. It's literally in the air. It's, it's ready for the taking. And the theme is breaking out of constraints, which is ironic on some level, because right now I want to pivot and talking about applying constraints. All right? So there's a way to get free by obliterating constraints and there's a way to get free by applying constraints let me explain the flip side it's not a contradiction don't worry but let me explain the pivot the other way of looking at things it's a folly i guess to quote our book overcoming folly it is a folly to believe that freedom consists human freedom consists of shirking off all forms of limitation, all forms of boundaries. I don't mean the spiritual ones, I mean the, the pragmatic ones. I'll give you an example. Imagine you tell a child, a young child, no rules anymore, no rules, no rules for bedtime, no rules for what you can eat or what you can't eat, no rules for if you go to school, when you go to school, how you go to school, you have zero rules, zero structure, zero um, – so what I'm looking for is zero um, expectations. Just you are free to live as you wish. I'm going to ask you a simple question. Do you believe that that, is, that that will be healthy for the child? All rules, all expectations, all – regulations, all sorts of framework being lifted from a child, do you think that would be healthy for the child or unhealthy for the child? What would that look like in most cases? Okay, David's thumbs downing. Yeah, would we agree with that? 
Yes, I, I think so. I have a, can I say something about that? Sorry? Can I say something about that? Yeah, for sure. The, um, it kind of reminds me of the stiff-necked um, uh, Jews that I guess they didn't have chiropractors or, um, and then it, it kind of reminds me of, um, you know, we kind of, we have a, a view of um, people in this country that say, you can't tell me what to do. And generally they're the less educated members of our society. Uh, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe this, uh, the slave mentality where, where we had, uh, you know, we, we, we felt like we couldn't have rules because uh, the rules we had were abusive. Um, it seems like the flip side of um, being, having, having too much, because I'm thinking if kids have too much, first of all, you guys are going to have to leave the house and find your, or live in your car because it'll be a little crazy. Um, but I'm thinking at some point, those, those kids are going to want rules. You know, right. they're going to be crying out for rules like, please put us in jail or we'll keep committing these crimes, <laughs> you know, domestic crimes while you guys are out of the house. So, so I think, so I, I think what you're saying is the notion of going from, yeah, human beings are extreme. Are, we're, we are by nature sometimes extremists. So when we see something wrong with one paradigm, we typically want to go the other way completely. And that could be the same mistake as the first mistake. In other words, if one extreme was, was, was mistaken, then the opposite extreme is likewise mistaken. And I think you and I are aligned in this notion of radical freedom being likewise radically confining. In other words, we think that, well, if, if rules or if, um, if, if these types of limitations are bad, then letting go of all limitations would be good. But again, using the example that I gave of a child, you tell a child, you could eat what you want, go to sleep when you want, et cetera. It's prob most likely there will very soon develop unhealthy habits within the child. Now, who am I to say unhealthy and who decides what is unhealthy? I'm just talking about from how much sleep is needed to a healthy diet, right? Most likely without the rules and without the structure, the child will devolve into unhealthy patterns of behavior. And the truth is, it's easier to speak of children. Why? I, I don't know. I think it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, because as we are adults here, it's maybe a little bit safer to speak about not us. But I would say the same thing with human beings, with, with adults. Adults shirking off all sorts of any type of limitation or societal expectation or, um, or, or constriction, I, I think could end up in a very negative place and oftentimes we've seen that happen and uh and and we've seen what that what that what, what type of anarchy that can cause here's the point here's the point a healthy human being needs a healthy structure and i know that i spent the first part of this class talking about how to break free from our limitations but those were the spiritual limitations what i'm talking about here is another concept which is a framework with, within which to operate. It's an overriding framework, a type of structure within which to experience freedom, which reminds me of a story that I think hopefully will clarify. There was once a publisher in the United Kingdom who was a publisher of a uh, satirical paper. And I'm forgetting the name of the publication and I'm also forgetting the name of the publisher. So there you go. So much for details in a story. Nonetheless, he was very irreverent, completely like, you know, nothing was sacred, you know, not religious at all. Later on in his life, he, he became more religious, not Jewish, but he became more religious. So he was once asked in an interview, what happened that you changed your life around and became this, uh, you know, this more religious type of individual. And he said, I'll tell you a story. I have a yacht. And one day I was, I decided that, you know, instead of being only a passenger on my own yacht that I own with a captain, why don't I find out how to captain my own yacht, right? I have the money for the yacht. I might as well uh, learn how to, how to captain the ship myself, the yacht myself. So he goes over to the captain and he says, can you tell me, can you give me a crash course? No, well, sorry, wrong term. Can you give me a... Uh, a um, 
a, a quick um, primer in how to captain a yacht. So the, the captain said, I'll tell you the first rule, the first rule of, uh, of captaining ships. And that is, if you want to enjoy the freedom of the high seas, you need to be a slave to the compass. I'll say that line again. If you want to master, sorry, if you want to enjoy the freedom of the high seas, you have to be a slave to the compass. Imagine if somebody says, I'm going out on a yacht. I don't want any rules and regulations. I don't want any dials and, 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 um, and indications. I don't want a, a compass. I'm going to sail and be free. You know what's going to happen? You may end up going in circles, right? You're not going to go where you're, you're not going to know where you're going and you may hit something and completely, uh, you know, destroy the ship. So what's the point? The point is that to really be free, to really be free, you need to operate within a framework. To really experience the freedom of what it means to be a human being, you have to have a framework, a healthy framework, right? Not a stifling framework, a healthy framework. For example, any musician knows if you're a pianist, how many keys do you have on your piano? Yeah, how many keys on a traditional piano? 88, right? 88. Was it also 88 miles per hour that the DeLorean needed to go in order to travel back in time? Was it 88? All right. Those are the keys to time travel. Anyway, we're making connections here. Where's Rabbi Chris when you need him? Getting back to our story. Getting back to our story. So 88 keys. All of the music that has ever been composed can be played on those same 88 keys. If you compose music, you know that there are certain scales and notes within which all music has been composed. So imagine if there wasn't a framework, imagine if there wasn't a framework, that would be not freeing, that would be distracting. Art is created using certain patterns. Music is created, not pattern. Art is created using a framework. Music is created using a framework. We create within a framework and the framework does not limit us. It opens up the experience. You tell somebody create anything and that anything could become more, it can become more slave, uh, uh, more enslaving than giving someone a framework because anything is really nothing. But give me a framework within which I need to create and now I can create. It's a bit, it sounds like a bit of a paradox, but you and I know this intuitively. You and I know that in the moments in our lives when we had no rules, we know what that ended up looking like. That wasn't healthy. Whereas when we had a framework within which to operate, we were mo the most optimized in our lives, living the best or in a more optimized fashion. The Rebbe writes to people many times in letters, the Rebbe wrote many times to people in letters who were struggling with various things. And one of the, again, it was, it was, a, it was an, a, 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 a constructive answer that applied to many different challenges that people were having. And the Rebbe's answer very often was, create more structure in your life, in your day-to-day -day activities, right? Whether it means a job or even a part-time job or just some sort of structure creating a structure to your day, a time that you wake up, a time that you do work, a time that you this, that, or the other, creating that structure will liberate your soul, will liberate your heart, will allow you to live in a more, allow you to breathe a little bit more. Now you say, well, wait a second. So how could creating structure, which, which sounds like imposing limitation on my day, how is that a freeing dynamic that seems like a stifling dynamic? Go figure, right? But that's the way it is. That's the way it is. We can operate the best. We can operate in the most healthy, free fashion when we have a structure around us, right? So even if it's not about a job, it could be about when do I get up in the morning, right? When do I get up? When do I, you know, pray? When do I study? When do I eat? When do I, whatever it is, like there's a structure to my day that is liberating. You and I know what it's like when there's no structure in a day, right? Right? Does that feel freeing? Maybe for the first day, 
after that, it's like, uh, right? Like, what are we, like, what's going on now? Children need structure, right? Right, Reeves? Yes? Okay. You want to say hi? Okay. Anyway, kids need structure. Ellie, do you agree with me? That you need structure? <laughs> Maybe. Anyway, it's a healthy thing. Which brings me to Egypt. Again, we looked at it one way. We're looking at it the other way. It's not a contradiction. There's subtlety here, right? There's nuance. It's not just one way. Or, right? There's now, we talked about the need to break out of limitations. Now the need for structure. Not limitation, but structure. So what happens with the Exodus? Right? So God frees us from Egypt. And you would think, well, that's it. End of story, right? We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. And then we got out. Great. Happy ending. Not so fast. Cut to the next scene. Well, cut a few scenes later. And there we are as a nation standing at the foot of Mount Sinai. Divine revelation. Getting a bunch of rules and regulations. Do this. Don't do that. Observe the set. What is that? I thought we were free. Whoa, this is bait and switch. We were slaves to Pharaoh. And now, God, it sounds like, it sounds like you want us to be slaves to you. I thought this was about freedom. I think I'm going to demand a refund, right? That's kind of what a person, what you might think. I mean, and I challenge you, right, to look at this story and not come to that conclusion. We were slaves in Egypt. We have the exodus, freedom, but in the next scene or two, there we are getting the most restrictive work that's ever been published. I mean, I, the Torah is pretty restrictive, 630 mitzvot. And we, I only say 613 to be kind and generous or to, be, to make it sound easy. Anyone who's ever studied a little bit of Talmud or a code of Jewish law knows that one mitzvah has about a thousand different details to it. I mean, yeah, build a sukkah. Sure, that's one mitzvah. <laughs> you want to know what it's like to build a sukkah? All the rules and regulations of building a sukkah. Yeah. Dozens and dozens of laws within that one category. So what's my point? My point is that far, that far from freedom being the absence of structure, what the Torah is telling us that freedom is the presence of structure, but a healthy structure, a divine structure. In other words, limitation or structure in and of itself is not unholy. It's not negative. It depends on which limitations you have. That's the question. So if the one who's giving you the rules is Pharaoh, you might want to get out of there. If the one giving you the rules is God, oh, now we're talking, right? It's a structure of truth. Exactly. Right. If if you have a divine structure, it's no longer Pharaoh's structure, it's God's structure, then you're in business. And paradoxically, it's having that structure, it's having those parameters that allow us to be free within those parameters. The absence of all structure does not equal freedom, it equals anarchy where people turn against each other. But I think more importantly, in our conversation, we turn against ourselves. Self-destructive behaviors are born, well, I, again, this is not an analysis and not a specific analysis, but can be born in an absence of structure, right? An absence of structure. If I don't need to wake up the next morning, if I don't have something to wake up for, if I don't have a, a schedule to my day tomorrow, so then maybe I'll stay up all hours of the night and right? And, and harm myself by not having the sleep that I need, et cetera. Again, I'm, it's not a specific focus on any specific area, just giving an example where an easy example where that might be manifest with a lack of structure. So what's the point? When Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go, he doesn't stop there. He said, God said, let my people go. First of all, it's God said, let my people go. It's not like Moses was a champion of human rights. God, Moses says, God said, let my people go. It wasn't Moses' people, it was God's people. 
am I am I being clear what I'm saying here? I think I should I should rewind it a little bit. The famous quote that everybody knows about Moses from Moses to Pharaoh is let my people go. And what it sounds like is Moses saying to Pharaoh, let my Moses's people go because they don't deserve to be no one deserves to be enslaved and 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 they should have freedom. Sounds wonderful, but that's not exactly that's not at all what happened. God said to Moses to tell Pharaoh, so said God, let my people go with a capital M, God's people go, so that they may serve me, not Moses, me, God, on the mountain. That's the full quote. Anything else is simply not accurate. So let my people go is nice for a bumper sticker, but it's not what Moses said. What Moses said is God said, let my people go so that they can serve me. You hear that word serve? So yeah, we are going from serving Pharaoh to serving God. You know why? Because serving God does not constitute limitation or enslavement. Serving God constitutes freedom. It's being a slave to the compass, which allows you to experience the freedom of the high seas. That is the role of healthy divine structure. The absence of which does not constitute freedom, but constitutes the, the worst of human limitation, where when one Pharaoh is gone, another Pharaoh is going to pop up in its place. And that new Pharaoh might be even more ruthless than the other Pharaoh, because it might be a Pharaoh of our own creation, which may be even worse. So it's the gift of Sinai that allows for a true liberation. And thus Torah models for, for, for all time, the true notion of freedom. Freedom is not the absence of limitation. It's the absence of unhealthy limitation and replacing it with healthy structure. That's the key distinction. Freedom is not no rules. Freedom is no evil rules, no negative rules. Freedom is healthy spiritual structure within which we can be optimized. There's an optimization, a human optimization that happens within a framework of healthy structure. Hey, Lisa, good to see you. So that is a key ingredient of the Passover experience. So gesund, Eli, Solish. So on the one hand, on the one hand, we have the notion of freedom being always looking to get out of our limitations. And if this was good for yesterday's me, today's me needs to be bigger and better. So that's one idea. But a second idea, and it's not a contradiction, we can hold two ideas in our mind. That's Baruch Hashem, we're blessed. Thank God we're blessed with, uh, with the ability to, be, to have nuance and subtlety. At the same time that we discard the limitations that hold us back, we embrace the parameters within which we operate which create a healthy space within which to grow and experience that freedom that we all need. It's like, hmm. Lisa, you can't hear? You can't hear me? All right. We'll have to, hopefully, you can get that troubleshooted. Um, okay, so essentially, essentially, um, the freedom that we're talking about is a dual type of freedom. Number one, based on everything I've said up until now, number one, it's recognizing that there's always room to grow. And, um, and, and, and what was free for me, what was a breakthrough yesterday, today constitutes the status quo. So I constantly breaking through my own limitations. And at the same time, recognizing there's a healthy framework within which I can operate to be free. So getting back to the example of children, when children feel, for example, that they have a very solid um, uh, foundation, they're more likely to explore because they know that they have they have a they have a space, they have they have a security, they have a, a secure space. Within that secure space, they can they can be free to explore. But you take you rob a child of a secure base, and there may be less of, a, of, a, of an inclination to really explore, to really be free, because there's a lack of, of, of that type of stability, a lack of that, uh, that comfort. So the framework creates a certain comfort, stability within which we can experience our freedom. Which brings me to today's topic. I mean, it's all today's topic, 
but which allows me to focus on the topic at least that I put into the email that I sent last night, which is about red lines. Now, what is a red line? A red line is a line in the sand that we draw for ourselves, a line that we draw for ourselves that says, I will not go past this line, right? This is something that I would never do. This is something that I do not do, I will never do, and uh, you know, never gonna go past that line. The problem with red lines is that often in life, the red lines become just, I'm, look, I'm thinking about like the uh, traffic lights. Red becomes yellow, becomes green. I know it doesn't work that way in, in, uh, with red lights. Usually it's green, yellow, red, green, you with me on this? Yes. The Kabbalah of traffic lights. But sometimes it works the other way around. It goes from a red line, like I would never do that to, well, maybe. What happens if I like put one toe over that line, like, ooh, or like touch the line? Like, would anything happen? Am I going to get zapped? No, okay. So then we wade in a little bit further until we step over and we're like, oh, you know what? I'm still here. I, I survived. I, it's not as bad as I thought. And the red line becomes now a green line and no longer becomes sacred. Now, this is the way it works for us at various points of our lives. Things that we thought that we'd never do, sometimes we end up doing it. And by the way, this does not mean that all of us are violating all of our red lines and, and, and nothing is sacred and nothing is, uh, nothing, nothing is, is, is off limits. No, I didn't say that. But throughout life, I think all of us, without getting you know, too personal and, and, and turn this into a, um, a confessional, I think we can, all, we can all understand that at some point in our lives, there was something that we thought we'd never do. And at, and at a later point in life, we found ourselves either doing it or getting very close to doing it. And, and the question is, so what happened? And, and is there any way to go back? Is there any way to go back to that place of innocence or naivete or, or redrawing that red line and stepping back over it, stepping back on the other side, once we've gone over to the other side? That's the question. So I want to share with you the context. Chapter 18 of Tanya. Chapter 18 of Tanya, he talks about the gift that is the soul, the godly soul. Each of us has what's called in Kabbalah and Hasidic philosophy in the book of Tanya. He elaborates on this at length. Each of us has within us two souls, two operating systems. Two completely different personas. Number one, the animal soul. So-called because like an animal, the animal soul is concerned solely for preservation of self, self-interest, etc. It's not a negative thing. It's just a natural, normal thing. And it's, animal soul is not bad. It's not evil. It just is about itself. So when, I, when, I, when the animal soul, when the animal feels threatened, it's going to protect itself. When it feels compromised, it's going to lash out. It's going to gather what it needs. It's going to hunt to eat. And in that way, it's going to share when it knows that it's beneficial to itself to share. I'm going to say that one more time. It will share and take care of others when it knows that it's to its own benefit as well, that that structure is set up. You with me on what I just said? Yes? All of that is the animal soul. The animal soul can also do things that are giving, but the intention is if I give, then the other will give to me. So it's in my, my, it's in my own interest as well. The animal soul is driven by self-interest primarily. We also have a godly soul. And the godly soul gives us a completely different set of gifts. The animal soul gives us one set of gifts. The godly soul gives us a completely different set of gifts. The godly soul is not about itself. It's about God, it's about purpose, it's about truth, it's about the other, unconditionally about the other. It's not about doing a mitzvah, doing a favor for someone else, giving tzedakah because then they're going to owe me a favor. No, it's about a mitzvah for the sake of the mitzvah. It's about a relationship with God for the sake of the relationship, not for the sake of self. It's altruistic. It's not self-serving. It's other serving. It's God serving. It's divine serving. It's purpose driven. That's the godly soul. So one of the gifts of the godly soul that the Alter Rebbe um, uh, expands, expounds upon in Tanya chapter 18 is the gift of the red line. What red line? Where because we have a godly soul, says the Alter Rebbe, when push comes to shove, 
in most cases, he's talking about historically amongst Jews, Jews historically have not traded in their Jew card even when it was very difficult, even when faced with death for being a Jew. So historically, right, many peoples in many different countries, many different eras, have sought for one reason or another, or maybe the same reason, I don't know, have sought to get rid of the Jew. And whether that's physically killing Jews or trying to spiritually take the Jew out of them while keeping their bodies around, essentially it's the same thing, right? It was about getting rid of the Jew. And by and large, Throughout the 33, depending on when you count from Abraham, 3,700 years, whatever, the last 3,000 plus years of Judaism and Jewish people, by and large, the vast majority of cases, like vast, vast majority of cases, Jews have not turned in their Jew card, even when faced with pressure and threats and even certain death. And the question is why. And in chapter 18 of the book of Tanya, the author of the founder of Chabad writes that this is another symptom, if you will, this is another outcome of the godly soul. That the godly soul is so burning with a fire and a clarity to God and about God that when push comes to shove, the godly soul says, no. This is a red line, and I'm not going to allow you, i.e. the person, to cross over that line. That is a line that cannot be crossed. Why? Why not? Just bow down. Just say that you're not Jewish anymore. Just, you know, even if you don't believe it, just say it. Can't do it. Why not? Can't do it. Can't do it. It's not a rational consideration. It's a soulful consideration. That is the argument put forth in chapter 18 of Tanya that we have a red line about identity that we cannot cross, not for logical reasons. It's not a rational consideration. It's not even emotional. It's inherent to the soul, to the divine soul. It just cannot be any other way. It's a red line that we cannot cross. And that's why he says throughout history, again, as I said before, but I'll add one more nuance that he says, you have people that weren't living very you know, proud, well, they weren't living very obvious Jewish lives. It's not like they were the synagogue goers and the every mitzvah, mitzvah doers, or the three hour a day prayer, prayers. It's not, it's, they were, you know, just, on the outside, you might have thought, well, if any, if there were any candidates to, you know, just going along with it, that might be the candidate. The author ever says, whoever that is, I'm not speaking about anyone specifically, I'm just speaking about a concept. Even that person, historically, by and large, in the vast majority of cases, would not and has not turned in their, their, their identity, their Jewish identity card. Why not? It's not a rational consideration. It's not a logical consideration. It's not based on prior performance. It's inherent and intrinsic. It's a matter of soul. The soul just doesn't allow it. It's a red line. But what about all the other things that are not a red line? What, are all the, what about all the other things that are not so severe? Right? So a person says, I would never renounce, turn in my Jew card. Right? I would never renounce my Jewish identity or faith, even by pain of death. But... This little thing, that's not what, uh, what I as a Jew should be doing. This little thing, I don't mind doing. So in this chapter that we're about to study today, which is going to be discourse number, I want to say discourse three, chapter one. Let's see if that's what this is. Nope. Discourse four chapter one, what he says over here is that that is another round of folly of the Yetzirah, the evil inclination. The difference between 
big things and small things is likewise a not so wise distinction. So we tell ourselves that, yeah, this little thing, sorry, this is a big thing. I would never cross that line, right? But this is a little thing. I don't mind crossing that line. We make a distinction between what we consider to be big, what we consider to be not so big. But who said that the big thing is a big thing and the small thing is a small thing? Maybe the small thing is also a big thing. Maybe the big thing is a small thing, right? Who says? It's a, it's a matter of perception, which means that as our perception is telling us that this is big and this is small, our perception could also tell us that the small thing is also a big thing, that it's a big deal. That is a way to get ourselves into a space of feeling that intensity, that passion about the little things, knowing that the little things are not so little or believing that the little things are not so little. So to summarize this, this what I believe is a very important point. It's believing that something is little and insignificant that can get us into trouble, right? Because we tell ourselves, oh, it's no big deal if. It's no big deal, right? It's, it's only a small thing. And that way, we get ourselves into trouble with, the, with that thing that's supposedly small. But repeated enough, a small thing becomes a big thing. And again, who says the small thing is only a small thing? Maybe it is also a big thing. And so therefore... Therefore, it becomes a dangerous space to be in, a more healthy space is to recognize that the small thing is a big thing. So for example, in a relationship, let's say in a relationship, a person would say, well, there's a line that I would never cross about being faithful, right? So there's a line that I would never cross to be unfaithful. That's a line that just is impossible to cross. But there's other behaviors or other activities that I, that I will do because, well, it's not crossing that red line right? These are little things. These are little things. But repeated little things could also affect the totality of the relationship. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes? So it's, it's this notion that, well, the big thing is a big thing, and the little thing is only a little thing, so it doesn't matter. But if you think about it, and it's, it's something born of experience, the little thing is not always so little. It's not always so little. Who says that it's a little thing? right? Who defined it as little? I know who did. We ourselves defined it as little. You know why? It's a strategy, right? To make ourselves comfortable with doing it. We told ourselves, well, it's not a big deal. It's only a little thing. But that little thing is not so little. You and I know that it's not so little. It compromises. And the example of the human relationship, it compromises the relationship. And it's the little stuff that leads, whether, whether or not it leads to a bigger thing, that in and of itself is compromising the relationship. In the example that we're gonna have in this chapter, and in a moment, we're gonna read this inside. He says, imagine you have a rope that's comprised of many strands. So you could, it's possible to take a big, um, what is that? Like a big, um, like a scissors thing. What do they call that? Like a big, you know those big heavy duty scissors? Like hedge. Yeah. Garden shears. Garden shears. There you go. Right. You could tell I'm a gardener by uh... anyway. Right. So you could take one of those things and cut the whole rope. Right. That certainly severed the connection. You know, that certainly severs the rope. Or you can cut one strand at a time. But it's only one strand. Yeah, it's one strand. But is the rope not compromised? Is it not weakened? It's weakened. It's weakened. So yes, there, we could say that there's a distinction between cutting the whole thing or cutting one strand. The problem is our inner voice, the Yetzirah, tells us that as an excuse to keep on cutting strands one at a time, before long, you know, it, 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 it compromises the connection. That's the reality of it. It compromises the, the, the connection. Now, in our chapter, we're speaking about our connection with God. I'm giving you a human example just because I feel like that's uh, oftentimes a, a more um, accessible way of understanding it. In other words, understanding how it is also in our life experience, 
um, reflected in a similar way. So again, just the I don't want to lose the core point. The core point is that we do have red lines, but oftentimes the red lines become green lines because we cross them. Why do we cross them? Because at some point we told ourselves, you know what? This is not as big of a deal as I thought it was, right? That's the head again. That's the rationalization getting involved again. Ah, oh, it's not such a big deal. I'll be okay even though. All right, well, now all bets are off, right? And that could lead to more and more lines being crossed until we've compromised enough that uh, or too much. And that's not a healthy thing. So again, not to focus on the negative, focus on the positive. The positive is, here's the positive meditation, is the details matter. The details are significant. Borrowing a popular expression, a popular idiom, God is in the details. Right? You know what that means? God is in the details means that the little stuff is not so little. The little stuff is big stuff. The little stuff is absolutely big stuff. It's not so little. And it's only the Yetzir Hara, the evil inclination that tries to spin it as something little and no big deal because it's only something little. Oh, I would never tell you to do the big thing, says the evil inclination. Only the little thing, which is not so important. Hook, line, and sinker, baby. That's the way the Yetzir Hara works. Right. In other words, it's not just that go ahead and try it. It's not a big deal. But the very notion that there are some things that are a big deal and some things that aren't a big deal, that's also part of the strategy of the Yet Sahara. Are you with me? If you and I were, were, were a, an employed Yet Sahara by God, we would totally be doing this. Right. If you if this was our job, right, to get someone to right. You and I would be pulling out this card all day. It's like, oh, oh, yeah, I totally respect your, your, your values to not do that big thing. I totally get that. Thank God this is not one of those big things. Thank God this is only a little thing. So you're totally safe here. This is a totally safe space, right? Wouldn't that work? Yeah, doesn't that work on us? That's all part of the mental gymnastics that we do to alleviate ourselves of that well to let ourselves off the hook really and the point here is that the more we appreciate the value of the detail the more we will be right where we need to be which means value the details i want to talk about art for a second because the other night thursday night i painted something and i haven't painted in a long time and I'm going to show you what I painted. Some of you saw this already. So I painted this Western wall uh, painting. We had paint night with Tanya Thursday night. And I painted this. Now, if you would have asked me, you know, do I think I could paint this? I would probably say no, not, no, not, ex not precisely. But I did have confidence because I did speak with the paint instructor. And she's like, she's like, I guarantee you, everyone's going to be able to do it. Even it's you. Beautiful. I'm like, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, it's even my, not even, but my kids also did. You see, there's a bunch of them. You have a bunch of Western walls over here because um, the kids did it as well. So this was yeah, literally. Yeah, all so all wall now. Yeah, we have literally, yeah, we have four of them. So we can actually ex make a full wall wall. Nice. The whole Western wall in your dining room. Literally. Yeah. And one of my kids was davening over Shabbos Friday night facing one of those pictures and they're like i'm praying by the wall i'm like yes you are and you sound like one of my kids because that's exactly hey. what i would have said um Beautiful. i'm but, sorry about about i'm late i i you changed the the time yeah the, the yes uh, oh yes 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 we did change the time yeah. you guys don't change the time in chile no oh yeah that's us <laughs> americans yeah pulling it fast yeah. yes sorry yes. we're we, yeah we we change the time yeah yeah, it's one of those things. I don't know why we're doing that, but that's what we're doing. Yeah. Um, so, so now, yeah, now for you, Kabbalah and Coffee is eight thirty. So no, it's it's late. Uh, no, it's ten thirty. Because we are we are um, oh one hour more. Yeah, oh. but it's it's <laughs> yeah, yeah it's no, too yeah, complicated. Sorry. For me. Yeah. So, but it's beautiful. The painting. I thank love. You. So here's but here's what I wanted to point out from this. So look. The way she did this, the way she taught this was one step at a time, one detail at a time. So it's you first apply white paint. And she's like, don't worry. Don't, don't ask too many questions while you're putting, just put the white paint. And it's like, 
You put the white paint because at some point you're going to learn what it means to blend colors and, and you create a fade and you need to blend. So there's white background, there's then color, then there's wet, there's a wet brush that blend. It's like a whole situation. It's, it's honestly, it's marvelous. It's wonderful. But here's my point. The details matter, right? The details. So what if I skipped out, right? What if we don't put, don't put the white as a base? Well, then you're never going to get you know, a blended situation, you're never going to get that blend because you're not, you're not going to have the white, the white as a basis. So you could say, no, I'm going to come in when it's really important, when I need the blue, right? Give me the blue and then I'm going to get going with the blue. doesn't work like that, right? The details are important. In life, it's the Yetzirah. It's that evil e inclination. It's the negative voice inside that says, oh, don't worry about that. That's a small thing. That's the negative voice inside that says it's only a detail. Anyone who's accomplished anything, and we all have, you and I know this from experience, that any great accomplishment that you've, that you've done was a product of attention to detail. It took, it was step by step. There, there were different things that you needed to learn, needed to do. It was a de detail by detail, step by step to accomplish what needed to be done. That's the way it works. That's absolutely the way, the way that it works. It's the details that matter. God is in the details. The details are holy. It's the Yetzirah that says, oh, those are only details. That's not really important. Don't worry about them. And that's where we might get, we might trip ourselves up. This book, as I say every week, is called Overcoming Folly. And the concept is meditations to challenge the negative voices inside that try to derail us from where we need to be. So where we where we want to be, where we need to be, no worries, where we need to be, bye, Sandra, and have a good one. But where we need to be is in a space of connection. That's where we want to be. That's where we need to be. And it's that inner voice that says, oh, don't worry about the connection. You'll be fine. Or, or um, don't worry about this detail. You're, you're not crossing over any big red lines. It's you're, you're fine where you are. And that's, again, that's all the eights are. That's all the evil inclination. So let's do this inside. It's really beautiful. Um, understand that all of this, this is not in any way, this is not intended, nor is it in any way a negative. It's not focusing on the negative. It's exploring the stories we tell ourselves to then tell ourselves a different story inside. If we know how the running narrative typically works, we're more suited to combat that in the moment. So I'm going to share my screen with you. This is overcoming folly. Can you see the, the text over here? Yes, it's coming up. Okay, great. Um, Rabbi, can I share one? Uh, some, uh, sure. Situation. Um, so regarding the, um, the small little uh, things that that we say are okay to cross. Um, a good analogy, because you talked about the broken uh, single strand is in rock climbing, <clears throat> they say <clears throat> there's a lot of extra slack of the rope uh, laying on the ground while you're pulling someone up and their lives are depending on this particular rope. And we actually, um, you know, you trust the equipment. Otherwise, you'd never be able to do something like that. And they say, don't step on the rope because a small pebble can get pushed inside this multi-strand rope, you'll never see it, but months later or years later, it's fraying from the inside out. It's cutting, 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 and all of a sudden the whole rope shreds and you fall to your death. So it's kind of perfect uh, analogy. Interesting, to, very interesting. The out, like from the, the, little, the little thing that you might not notice could create, yeah. And again, it's the, the, the concept is, you know, I don't want this to sound too much like, you know, doom and gloom and fire and brimstone. That's not the intention here at all. And, and I'm not saying that's your intention either. I think it's actually an incredible example, incredible analogy or, or, or way in which we see that come, come true in life. Um, but again, I just, just for the sake of the conversation, I want to, I want to emphasize, this is not about negative, the negative focus, but the positive focus, the power of the attentiveness to the detail. When we are attentive to details, right? How life affirming and life saving that is, Right, how beneficial it is when we do pay attention to the details. So let me share my screen. We're going to jump into chapter four. Sorry, discourse four. Look at that. I can highlight it now. I'm using a different PDF program, right? You see what I just did there? Now that I highlight. All right, discourse four, 
chapter one, but everything's going to be yellow soon. So I have to stop doing that. Okay, so here we go. Discourse for chapter one, adultery and idolatry. We're going to have a, you know, I used the example before about a human relationship and, and a divine relationship. Indeed, this is the parallel is, is here as well from the, the Rebbe, the, the fifth Rebbe, Rebbe, the Rebbe Rashab, who authored this text. Let's, let's jump in. It is obvious now, he says, that the fact that the Yates are hard of the evil inclination. One second, let me make this a little bit bigger. Why not, right? Oop, that's a little bit too big, I think. One second. There we go. Okay, it is obvious now that the fact that the Yates are hard persuades him that despite any evil deed, he is not separated from God's oneness. Right. The HR says, no, 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 no. Don't worry. You're still fine. That's not a big deal. So that voice, it should be clear by now, is simply the spirit of folly that camouflages the truth. Right. That's not true. That's just the tactic of the Sahara that says it's no big deal. As mentioned earlier, our sages phrase it on the verse, if his wife turns astray, one does not commit a sin unless the spirit of folly enters. Him. Right. The Talmud says, right, when talking about a suspected case of infidelity, that no one would ever commit any sin without the spirit of folly entering them. It's not like supernatural spirit of folly. It's like without the stories that we tell ourselves. He says, he gives an example of the, um, the unfaithful spouse, even an adulterous woman with her frivolous nature. In other words, even the one who is not so faithful could control her passions were it not, could control her passions were it not for the spirit of folly that covers, obscures, and conceals the hidden love with her, within her godly soul that would impel her to cleave to faith in God and his unity and oneness and not be separated from God, even at the cost of her life, enduring martyrdom instead, rather than submitting to apostasy. In other words, what he's saying is, even someone who crosses one line wouldn't cross a very big line, the ultimate line, right? Because to them, to that person, well, this is a small line and that's a big line. But as we'll say here, that's all perception, not necessarily reality. We have noted in Discourse 2, Chapter 1, and this comes from Tanya, that it is in the nature of the souls of Israel that they are incapable of being separated from God because of the innate love within them. For this reason, even the most, I don't like this translation, worthless, it just means even the one who doesn't demonstrate always a fiery commitment to God will readily sacrifice his or her life for the sanctification of his name. In other words, even someone who's not, you know, always externally, even for themselves, living a super on fire spiritual life, when push comes to shove, will by and large not renounce their Judaism. And again, it's not, and this is not like theory. This is not a philosophy or a theory. This is born of experience. I can't tell you how many stories came out of the Holocaust, the same thing, where you have people who were, I'm sure I've told these stories before, people that were not so, you know, outwardly at least, you know, discernibly committed to their Judaism. But when push came to shove, they were like, yeah, this is who I am, and, and no one's going to rip it away from me, even if, even if it means taking my life. I'm not giving it up. I'm not, I'm not renouncing who I am. So the point is that that's a big red line that, that he's saying most or everyone has, and therefore they won't cross it. And take a look, he continues. Even for appearance sake, for appearance's sake, without any faith in the strange God she is forced to worship, she would not even go through the motions of kneeling. In other words, this, we're giving an example of this person who would, would do some other things that, you know, would, would, would violate some other things, but would not violate, would not hand in their Jew card, even if it's only superficially. Anyone capable of this sacrifice, which is the ultimate sacrifice, paying with one's life, is certainly able to restrain the eighth Sahara, the evil inclination. The passion for this is far less of a suffering than martyrdom is. May God protect us. Right. So, in other words, give an example about about an unfaithful spouse. So, like, right, the the um, the passion for that for that violation is certainly less than the pain of martyrdom, the ultimate sacrifice. And yet, 
the person would be would be willing to make one sacrifice. So if they're willing to make that sacrifice, certainly they would be theoretically able to make the other sacrifice. The fact that she differentiates between the sin of, of adultery and the sin of idolatry is also a shtos. It's also a foolishness, a folly of the klipa that clothes the godly soul. She is deluded that with her adultery, she's not separated from God and that she retains her Jewishness. The truth is that though, that it, the truth is though that whoever violates even a minor commandment violates God's will and is completely and utterly apart from God's unity and oneness. Now, again, this sounds like fire and brimstone. That's not the intention. The intention, I, and I know what you're thinking. Well, it says even a minor commandment is violating God's will, completely and utterly apart from God's unity and oneness within a context. Not so fast. It's within a context. The context is either we're being plugged into where we need to be or we're plugged in elsewhere at that time. It's one or the other in this moment. So in this moment, either I'm doing what I need to be doing or I'm, or, or I'm being distracted and doing what I'm not meant to be doing. So if I have the ability with a, a big red line to never cross that line, I have the ability with other lines to not cross that line as well, as long as I know that it's big. And that's what he's trying to say. Don't think of it as a small line. A minor commandment is also a big deal. That's his point. This is the meditation. This is for our benefit. This is not finger wagging. This is not fire and brimstoning. This is not a negative. This is to our benefit. This is a meditation. What's the meditation? I just want to be very clear. This is a meditation. The meditation is this to matters. This makes a difference. This is important, right? That is the meditation. The meditation is this action, this decision matters. Yes, if the ultimate choice was placed before me, I would definitely act and affirm, sorry, and assert my identity. But this little thing, I don't feel so compelled to do so. So what's the answer? Don't think of it as a little thing. Think of it as a big thing. And if you think of it as a big thing, you'll respond in a big way. That's the entirety of this message. And again, to, to further drive home that this is also a big deal. Again, it's not fire and brimstone. It's a meditation for us. He's even further from God than the Sidra Akron Klippa called other gods and utter idolatry more than all those creatures that derive their nurture from them, which include unkosher animals, unkosher fowl, insects, and reptiles. In other words, think that in the moment in which I violate my identity and what God wants from me, so I am in this moment lower than even the lowliest of creatures. And he continues, the Talmud declares, the gnat preceded you in creation, the gnat which consumes but does not excrete, which represents the klipa of taking and not giving, represents the lowest klipa, the most distant from holiness for the characteristic of holiness is giving, even in the most distant manner. Even this lowly insect has precedence over the sinning human in the descent of the life force from the divine will. The life force of the sinning man is far more concealed and far more distant from God than the life force animating the, the gnat, this insect. It goes without saying that all, that the other unkosher animals, even wild beasts, are all superior to the sinning man. Why? Because they do not pervert their functions. They don't violate God's purpose. They keep his orders. They keep God's orders. Although this is all unknowing, in other words, they don't, it's not a choice. They don't intentionally choose to follow God and, and, and not to not follow God. It's all unknowing. It's unconscious on the part of the animals. It's written, fear of you and awe of you shall be upon the beasts of the land. So in other words, there is a, there, it, it's, it's an embedded nature within the animal that it's going to do what it needs to do and not violate that. Nonetheless, it doesn't violate its purpose. But getting back to this verse, which is interesting, it says, God says to Adam that when it comes to the animals, fear of you. Sorry, God says this to Adam or to Noah? Genesis 9-2. Definitely not Adam. Yeah, it must be to, um, to Noah, I believe. I'll have to look that up. Um, I don't know if Chumash right near. You know what? One second. Let me just quickly grab this to make sure we got the context correct. Yeah. 
Yes, indeed. It's God telling this to Noah once Noah gets off the ark. So he gets off the ark and God says, all right, don't worry about the animals. The animals will, uh, will respect you. Right? Fear of you and awe of you shall be upon the beasts of the land. They're going to respect you. They're going to have reverence for you. They're not going to start up with you. The Talmud comments on this, tracted Shabbat, take a look, that a wild beast cannot affect a man unless he seems to be an animal. Right? Animals will never attack a human being unless the human being looks like, another, like, looks like an animal to the animal. See that? To the beast. Tzadikim, righteous, whose countenances always testify to the image of God, find all wild beasts humble before them. This is how the Zohar, Kabbalah, interprets the account of Daniel in the lion's den. So if Daniel, he was thrown into the lion's den and survived, how is it? Because he had the image of God upon him. Basically, God promises in the Torah that if you look like a mensch, then the animal cannot harm you. Now, am I, listen, disclaimer, you try this at your own, at your own risk, and I'm not taking any responsibility. Do not jump into a lion's den and start davening and studying Torah and, and, and whatever. Don't, don't be reckless. But the point is that when a human looks like a human, when a person is reflecting the divine image that ideally they're meant to be reflecting, then an animal won't start up with the human being. It's only when the, when the human looks like another fellow animal that the animal will, will attack. And that's the point that he's, that is, and that, that's the point that he's saying here, that when, when a human being turns away from purpose and descends into negative behaviors, the human being is like an animal, but even worse, because the animal never violates its purpose. But a human, in violating their purpose, is violating their purpose. So here's the conclusion. I mean, not the conclusion, but here's the, the therefore. So whoever transgresses God's will, even in a lesser commandment, is at that moment utterly estranged from the supreme holiness, his unity and oneness. His state is far inferior to the unkosher animals and insects and reptiles which derive their nurture from the sitra achra and the klipa of idolatry. So the point is, the point is that, again, it's a meditation for us. There's no such thing as a small thing. There's no such thing as a little thing. Oh, it's only this small thing. It's not a big deal. It's not like a big red line that I'm crossing. So it doesn't matter that I do this or don't do this. It's only small. His point is, this is a meditation for us. No, this is, this is a big deal. This, this choice will separate me from where I want to be. Again, using the relationship example, I know he uses it a little bit differently here. But this is my relationship example. Person would say, well, I would never, you know, be unfaithful, but, you know, this, that, or the other, I might do. And, and how to get out of that is to tell oneself, this is already a big deal. It's not only a big deal at that point, this is already a big deal. This constitutes my fidelity. This constitutes how committed I am and how respectful I am of the other this moment, not if it gets to anywhere else, but this moment right now is a statement of, of where I am in the relationship. That's a, that's not a negative meditation. That's not fire and brimstone. That's positive and empowering. That's an incredible meditation. And that's exactly what he's saying here is picture in your mind that this little thing, this little mitzvah, is your relationship with God in a nutshell. This is it. Are you connected? Are you, are you with God? Are you, are you on your own in this moment? Don't wait till the big moment of, you know, will you or will you not give up your Judaism? That's, I mean, hopefully we'll never face that, right? But that's, that's easy, if you will. That, that, an, that question answers itself. But where we come in is the little stuff, the everyday stuff. Right? Are we are we thinking about God, the other in our relationship? Right? Are we thinking about God? Or are we thinking about just what we want in the moment? That's God is in the details. This little detail is what matters in this moment. So this is the meditation that is for us, designed specifically for us. Um, I want to finish off. We're going to do a few more paragraphs. And then close it out because I want to make sure that we finish this discourse. It's a short discourse. This, this mini discourse is very short. And I want to make sure to finish it and not stay in the middle of it because I'll tell you about some scheduling things coming up with Passover. All right. So 
Let's start, let's pick it up. Let's continue right here where it says weakened by sin. But besides the distance and separation that is caused by the sin, there's something more involved. This gets back to the rope analogy. Sin causes a defect in the soul. In other words, every sin somewhat weakens the connection and its bond with God is severed. Now, not in totality, but one strand. In Igarita Tshuva, which is a, a book also written by the author of the founder of Chabad, chapter five in the verse, Jacob is the cord of his inheritance. So it talks about Jacob, cord, and inheritance. So over there, we learn that a cord, a rope, binds the soul and God, similar to a physical cord, one end of which is bound above and the other end bound below. This represents the descent of the soul from its source in the latter He of Havaya, God's name, the latter letter He in God's name, to this mundane universe where the soul inhabits the physical body of man. Okay, we don't have time to get into that. The bottom line is that there is from the supernal divine name of Yuke Vavke, God's name, the lower He extends down to create the soul and then enliven us. And there's like a cord, there's a connection between us here, soul in the body, and its source above. A thick cord woven from 613, I like this analogy, a thick cord woven from 613 slender strands symbolizes the cord between soul and God, comprising the 613 commandments. So there's 613 points of connection symbolized in this analogy by 613 strands that make up this thick rope. Violating a commandment severs a strand and weakens the entire cord. Now, sin punishable by excision, that means like being totally cut off, if you will, severs the cord completely, and the soul is cut off completely, God forbid. The persuasions that cause man to sin then, in other words, the evil inclinations, rationalizations that cause man to sin, are obviously due to the spirit of folly that obscures reason and makes man irrational. Were he not to be enticed by the Yetzirah's temptings, were he not to be enticed by the Yetzirah's temptings, but he would see the truth as it is that an act of sin separates man from God so thoroughly that man falls to the lowest depths of the defilement of the sitrach and the clip of the other gods, God forbid, besides defecting the soul, which we just said, it, it cuts a strand. It could always be retied, re but it's still in the moment it's compromised. If a person realized that, the concealed love within him, which makes it impossible for him to be apart from God, would inspire him, keeping him from the stumbling block of sin, regardless of the circumstances. So if we were only a little bit more meditative, realizing that this is not a small thing, this is a big thing. And if I do this, then it puts me at the bottom of the totem pole of existence because everything else is doing what it needs to do. And I'm the one that's not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And, 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 I'm, and I'm compromising my relationship with God. And I'm compromising the strands of my soul with God. Why would I ever do that? It's not a little thing. It's a big thing that's happening. And that'll keep me out of trouble. So again, it's important for me to emphasize, I feel a personal obligation because I am a positive believing person. I believe in positive encouragement and not negative encouragement. Therefore, I feel that it's very important to, to emphasize multiple times until you are annoyed with me, that this is in no way trying to make us feel bad or make us feel guilty or fire and brimstone us or wag fingers. No, this is giving ourselves ammunition against our own negative voice inside. When that voice comes and says, oh, why don't you try this? It's no big deal. So what do you say to that voice? What do you say? I, we got some stuff now. You tell that inner voice, no big deal, you say. I say it is a big deal. I don't want to do this. I say it's a big deal. I believe that by doing this, as you suggest, you're talking to your inner voice that I believe that by doing this thing, as you suggest, it's going to put me in a place that I don't want to be in. So the answer is no. That's what you tell your inner voice. But without that narrative, then what chance do you have? All you have is one side of the argument that says, do this, it's not a big deal. And what's your answer? You're right, it's not a big deal. And you know what happens next? There you go. You're, you're doing it. You're crossing that little line because it's not a little line in your head. But meanwhile, it is a, it, it is a line. So this is what we're, this is a, a meditation that's an incredible tool and a gift for us to have for ourselves. Do not use this toward anyone else. This is not meant to be like, oh, I cannot believe you did that. Do you know what that means about you? Do you know that you are now lower than an animal? Do you know that you're now, you know, cutting off strands of your soul, severing or compromising strands of your soul? 
God forbid to look at someone else that way or to talk to anyone else that way. God forbid, or to think about anyone else that way, right? You have to judge others favorably. For ourselves, we have to be honest and real and unflinching. We have to tell the inner voice that's whose job it is to get us to fall. I will not do that because it goes against my best interests. And even if you tell me it's not a big deal, I believe it is a big deal. So the answer is no. That's my meditation. Does that make sense? Yes? That's it. So hopefully today we are inspired with more brain ammunition to challenge the challenges that come our way. When the inner voices of folly say, try me, right? This is not so bad. The response is, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. I don't want to go down that path. That path is not where I want to go. But it's not a big deal. I'm not telling you to do that. Just this. I feel that this is a big deal. So I don't want to do it. I feel this is a big I feel already this is a big deal. So I don't want to do it. And you know what happens then in that moment? The Yad Sahara smiles and says, good job. Good job. Because my job was only to offer it and, conv- and, and, and sell it. Your job was to reject it. I did my job. You did your job. Excellent. I'll be back tomorrow. Don't worry. The HR, or five minutes. But in that moment, the Yetzirah itself smiles. 30 seconds. 30 seconds, right. But in that moment, the Yetzirah smiles and says, thank God you didn't listen to me. Because that was not the purpose. The purpose was never for you to listen to me. The purpose was for you to reject me utilizing whatever strategies you can. This is literally mind strategy to keep ourselves in a healthy place. All right, I'm sure this could be adapted to business strategy and to other things and to just human um, optimization strategies, which it kind of is, but certainly the context is spiritual, mitzvot, connection with God, but it could be applied every, you know, in in any different place. The point is the one who's the most prepared is typically going to be going to be the one that's, that's the victor. So if you don't have a response to that voice that says, it's not a big deal. This is not, I'm telling you to do a big thing. It's a little thing. You, you'll like it. You'll enjoy it. No harm, no foul. If you don't have a response to that, then that's what's going to happen. The response is, if it, assuming that it's not so, not so holy, not so kosher, then the response is, with all due respect, I, to me, this is a big deal. I don't want to be disconnected, even in this little moment, even in this moment, even if you're telling me it's not a big deal, I choose not to be disconnected. I choose connection. So my friends, here's the deal. Here's the deal. It's those limitations. It's the subservience. Nasan, you want to say hi? No. All right. It's the subservience. Nasan. Hi. All right, there we go. Just got back from Chicago Yeshiva for Passover a few days ago. His first um, cameo in Kabbalah and Coffee since his triumphant return for the holiday. So we all need two things. Number one, get rid of the, the limitations. Get rid of the limitations that hold us back. If it was a breakthrough yesterday, that's great. But today, create a new breakthrough. What was a breakthrough yesterday is today's limitation, today's status quo. Break through it, number one. And number two, healthy framework is good. Healthy limitations are good. They are empowering and freeing. The musician composes with certain notes. The artist paints with certain colors, right? The creator builds with certain materials. You create a structure. You you impose a certain structure, and you can create and be free within that structure. And so that is the message today, this week, getting up to, uh, leading up to Passover. Number one, break through the obstacles. And number two, recognize the gift that is the lines that we have in our lives. When we violate the lines, it's, it may feel freeing and liberating, but it just creates the anarchy and the chaos. Having those lines past which we tell ourselves, I don't go past this line. I know you're suggesting that I do, but this is my framework. I I operate within this framework. I don't go past those lines. That's liberating. That's empowering. 
on every level, spiritually, psychologically, and emotionally. My friends, there's a lot more to talk about, but I have to run, unfortunately. So I want to wish you all a wonderful day, a wonderful week, a wonderful Chag. Please join me tonight, 7.30 p.m., prepping for Passover. Get in the spirit of the holiday and also get practically prepared. That's all coming up tonight, 7.30. For the link, just go to the website, intownjewishacademy.org, um, slash Passover, and just hit, hit the RSVP or hit the at the cart button and go through it. It's free, and I'll send you the link. I'll also post it to social media, to Facebook, so I'll post the direct Zoom link there as well. If you already signed up, I'll send out the email soon with the link, information for Zoom. That's tonight at 7.30. Have a wonderful week. Great to see you all. Yaakov, David, Donna, Marnine, Matt, Linda, Tony, Susan, Toba, Mariana, Joy, and Fran. Thank you very much. Shavuot Tov. Chag Sameach. Happy Pesach. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Pleasure. Bye, everybody. I love the details. Awesome. Yes. God is in the details. See you guys soon.